We all want to feel peace in our lives. Peace in our choices, our beliefs, our relationships, and our environment. I've learned that this desired contentment is often found through holding on to less. When we pare down what we own, what we consume, and what we value, we're left with what's intentional, a personalized curation of what is important and true and useful to us. I'm Shannon Laco, and you're listening to Paring Down, a podcast aimed at helping you declutter not only your home, but any area of your life that's overwhelming. Here, we're having interesting and honest conversations about the physical and mental clutter that drowns out what truly matters to each of us. And together, we'll learn how to pare it all down, not for the sake of perfection or becoming rigid, rather so we can move through life with less overwhelm and more joy, wisdom, and peace. Hey, everyone. If you want to glean some serious wisdom, today's episode is for you. I had the absolute honor of interviewing Glenn Van Pesky. And if you don't know who Glenn is, I'm so excited you're about to find out. Glenn is the founder of Gossamer Gear, which is a highly successful ultralight backpacking company, uh, working with this kind of minimalist world for a long time, but in the backpacking space, which is so interesting. And you certainly don't have to be a backpacker in order to listen to today's episode, because we are talking all things about his new book, Take Less, Do More. And it's really the lessons that he learned about living minimally when he's out in the wilderness that he can then kind of implement into his personal life, into his real life back at home. And the lessons are astounding. He talks so much about generosity and gratitude and curiosity and his wisdom really knows no bounds. His stories are also super fun. Like I couldn't believe it when I saw the blurb in his book from Matthew McConaughey and I was like, oh, Matthew McConaughey did a blurb for his book. And then I'm like, oh, and the forward is by John Mackey, who's the founder of and CEO of Whole Foods. And I'm like, who is, what is happening here? This is so highly recommended. And then the story is of like when he went on a hike with <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. And, and anyways, it's a really entertaining read. I, I honestly have been in a reading slump recently. And this book got me out of my reading slump because I couldn't put it down, not only because the stories were so interesting, but because it was so inspiring and reminded me to live this intentional pared down life that even though you would think I like am constantly I am constantly trying to do that. Obviously, I have this podcast and decluttering is important to me, but the way he approaches it is on such a higher level. And I think it's so important to hear from people with such deep wisdom who've been around a little longer than I have, right? And and to glean his um, his perspective on things and learn from the life lessons that he has experienced himself, it just is a joy in his book. And it was a joy in this podcast interview. You're going to hear about how generous he is with his time and his life and his space uh, through minimalism in this interview. But I mean, he sent me not only a signed copy of his book, he sent me a signed copy of Joshua Becker's book, Things That Matter, which is amazing. And then I just got a notification yesterday in my email that Glenn Van Pesky is sending me another book. Like it, I got the UPS thing and I'm like, what? What is this man up to? And he's become kind of like a pen pal of sorts ever since the interview, which was, I think, gosh, it's been a month or so now. We've been communicating still via email, uh, just sharing stories and I don't know. We I just have a wonderful connection with him. I feel like he is somebody that I feel really honored to be in the world with at the same time and to learn from. And he continues to give me nuggets of wisdom personally, just in emails. So I really hope you enjoy this really deep, really powerful conversation with author, backpacker, entrepreneur, engineer, overall, really good dude, <laughs> Glenn Van Pesky. Glenn, this is truly an honor to have you on. I have your book right here. I have been devouring it. It's Take Less, Do More, uh, which I couldn't be more obsessed with that sentiment on a grand scale. So thank you so, so much for being here. My pleasure. Always, always, fun, to, always fun to chat and meet new friends. It really is. That's my favorite part of podcasting is I just feel like it's expanded my network of people that I really adore because while we have these listeners listening in and it's such an honor that these conversations are being kind of spread throughout the world, it really is an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation when we're recording. And so friendships develop really, really easily. And it's, um, it really is an honor to do this kind of work. It's, it is fun. It's, that's been an unexpected pleasure for me. I kind of had to get drugged kicking and screaming into the podcast thing because I'm an introvert and it's like, yeah, it's like, there's lots of things. This is pretty bottom of my list of what sounds like a fun way to spend an hour. But um, I've been surprised and 
just it gladdens my heart to meet new people and connect with people. And it's, it's been a lot more fun than I thought. I'm glad you've been enjoying it uh, because word does need to get out about your book because I want everyone to read it. Before we dive into all of the lessons and wisdom that you have to share, I just have to tell you that while I've been reading, I'm about a hundred pages in, it's the kind of book that I was writing down notes and I realized I basically wanted to walk through every single page with you and be like, oh, this and this and talk about everything because it uh, it really speaks to my soul. But a couple things that we have in common, which is really fun. So you had your engineering career in San Diego, which is where my family is from. They're in Point Loma, uh, my mom's side of the family. So where were you in San Diego? Uh, we were up in Carlsbad. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in Scripps Ranch till I was like eight. So that's fun. Also love to meet a fellow mountain person because I currently live next to the beach and I'm just surrounded by beach people all the time. And I deeply miss Alaska, which is where we used to live. So you're a mountains person and uh, you know, your outdoor perspective, your love for outdoors and how that, you know, changes how we look at the world, I think is so powerful. We need to talk about this more. It was a really big, um, is something my mom taught me growing up. And one of the things I know you'll share about, hopefully I'll, I'm going to ask you about it, is how you put these trips together with people who you don't know very well. <clears throat> and so you go on these grand adventures, these big hikes, you don't really know the people and it levels the playing field. You get to know everyone and you push yourself and there's just really no what better way to connect with people. Because like you said, it takes away all of this unnecessary um, divides and, and, you know, we, we come to common ground and it reminded me, I went on a dog sledding trip when I was 22 years old with wow. nine strangers in Ely, Minnesota. And we slept on frozen lakes. I showed up, it was through outward bound. I'm sure you've heard of them, of course. And, um, it was the best experience of my life. Hardest thing I would never do again. I mean, it was, it was insane, but, um, you're, when you share about your hiking trips with people, just reminded me of that. So I apologize by kicking off this podcast, listening to myself talk when I really want to hear from you, but there was too much to not be like me too, me too. I want to share this with you. No, it's, it's awesome to hear other people's stories. Um, cause I get tired of talking and yeah, I mean, winter camping, <clears throat> that's not something I've done. A lot of, I mean, I've hiked in snow for weeks, but I always figure to me, when you have to melt snow for water, that's winter camping. And that's not something that I do really at all. It, it's, it's a lot. It's really a lot. You know, we'd walk out to the, we'd be sleeping on the frozen lakes. And so, cause that was just easier for our, our group and our three teams of dogs. And so you'd walk to the middle of the lake and drill the hole to get the water. And that was someone's job. And, and similar to you, what you share about ultralight backpacking, we didn't have tents, you know, we would just do a tarp over ourselves because the dogs really were carrying the majority of our provisions. And so you have to meet a certain weight requirement for the dogs. And so, yeah, all of this definitely would be really good actually for, uh, for that winter camping. Um, so I have to start with, well, you know what, hold on. I want to start with so much, but you need to introduce yourself to everyone. I haven't even gotten there yet. So can you tell everyone who you are and a little bit about your background? Uh, sure. I'm Glenn Van Pesky. I am a uh, retired civil engineer. Although, as you being married to an engineer, you know, it's like people say you were an engineer. It's like, no, I am an engineer. Once you're an engineer, you are an engineer. It doesn't matter what you happen to be doing. Um, so I'm a, a civil engineer. I had a civil engineering career and along the way accidentally started a backpacking company, uh, which has led to a whole series of experiences and friends and ultimately was a piece of the chain that ended up with me writing a book. Yes. It all started with the love of backpacking. I would say with that so far from what I'm learning about you from the kind of Boy Scouts trip with your son, you know, piggybacking on top of the cross country cycling trip you did after high school, which sounds so fun. So let's start maybe with that backpacking trip, because I do feel like that's the catalyst for so much here um, in this interest in ultralight backpacking. And then how these lessons, um, you know, the, the title of your book is Take Less, Do More, Surprising Life Lessons in Generosity, Gratitude, and Curiosity from an Ultralight Backpacker. So how these lessons from taking less hiking have found their way into your life. 
So would you share that story of uh, your first hike, that 25 miler with your son? And what was your big reasoning for why you wanted to take less the next time? Sure. And in the book, for purposes of the narrative, some hikes are kind of mushed together. Um, I mean, we had a whole training program uh, of some progressively harder like weekend hikes. And then the capstone trip was a week in the Sierras. Um, and that was, you know, that was a solid effort, as we say here in the alley. I mean, it was a serious trip. Uh, I left the trailhead with 70 pounds in my pack for, you know, a week's worth of food. And I didn't know anything at that point about going light. Um, and we were going up, you know, 10,000 foot passes one a day. Usually we're on the Pacific Crest Trail for, uh, through the Sierras, uh, doing kind of a loop. And, you know, it was one thing for me, uh, I was an adult and able to carry that kind of weight, but, you know, for the boys, I mean, they were just struggling and we were crawling along. We often weren't able to make the mileage that we had planned and had to, had to adapt. So it was about this time that my buddy, Reed Miller, who was the scout master of the troop, read Ray Jardine's book on his original book, The Pacific Crest Trail Hiker's Handbook. And I still remember Reed giving me a copy of the book and saying, check this guy out. And it's like, he's, it seems like we could do things a lot lighter. And I remember flipping to the back and looking at a gear list that he had. And he had a base weight, which is all your gear, except what you're wearing and no food and water, uh, because that the food and water varies with the length of the trip and, and the environment. Um, and he had a, Ray Jardine had a, a gear list in the back of the book that was a little over eight pounds. And I, I just remember reading, I staring at that, trying to wrap our heads around that. It's like, what the heck? That's just crazy. And now, I mean, I'm usually going out with a base weight of under five pounds and I can't remember. It's been probably decades since I broke eight pounds. Um, so it's all relative. Uh, but that was kind of what kicked off my interest in, in ultralight backpacking. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? It sounds obvious, but I wanted you to share that story because it's such a perfect analogy that the boys were struggling and I'm sure you were too with 70 pounds on your back. You could do it, but like, you know, you had to put your big kid pants on and not complain as much as the kids, but you know, it's, um, it's hard to really enjoy the experience. You know, I mean, I've gone backpacking. My dad used to take us backpacking as kids when we lived in San Diego, we go in the canyons and the most, the, the biggest thing I honestly remember is that it, I always had to walk in front of him because of mountain lions, <laughs> you know, that's what stuck with me. But, um, you know, I do, I remember that or it, it's, it's cumbersome. And so then they can't enjoy, like you said, the, the views and they can't enjoy the experience as much. Now it is important to push ourselves and do hard things because there's so many lessons there. Um, but I love that the lesson there was that you can see more and experience more when you have less. So when did that mindset and how did that mindset start transferring into how you kind of saw the world at large? Well, I noticed that there were a number of kind of applications to life in general. Um, and, you know, there's, I've, I've done a, a varying, it's, it's complicated when I backpack, I'm, responsible for just my gear. And so I get to make all the choices and I am the one that, you know, deals with the, the ramifications of the decisions I've made, but I've been married, uh, 42 years this month. And so at home, it's a compromise. You know, I, the, the house does not look like it does if, um, if I was single for sure, <laughs> there's more stuff in it, uh, because my wife and I have different opinions on stuff. And, um, and so it's a compromise, but in how I approach life, um, I think there are many applications, um, to time spent on the trail and minimizing your load there. Um, and part of it, I guess on a, on a big sense is creating margin in your life. Um, so when you go backpacking with less gear, you're creating a margin. You can go further if you need to. Um, you can 
help redistribute gear if someone gets hurt. We were in Buckskin Gulch recently uh, with Francie, my wife, and her arthritis was acting up. And so I just took her pack, put it on my back, put my pack, put it on my front. And I was still carrying less than most of the people that we met in the canyon. So it gives you options. And, and when you do that in your life and you create margin in uh, time, money, and energy by not over scheduling yourself, by setting money aside so you can address the needs of others that uh, come across your path, um, then you can enjoy life more and you know make more contribution. I mean, that right there is exactly, I have written that I want to dive into how you've connected minimalism with kindness and generosity, because I think that's what makes this book so very special. You know, even in the first uh, third of it that I've been able to read is that while we do experience so many benefits from carrying a lighter load ourselves, of course, whether that's on the trail or throughout life, you know, and that can be inside our homes with the amount that we own, um, or that can be just in our in our mindsets and the the things that weigh on us in a not literal sense, right? There's so much that we can release that feels good for us, but something that is so special that you've really um, captured is how when we take less, we can do more, not just for ourselves, but for the world at large, which really starts with the individuals in front of us, like you said, with your wife needing help on the trail, right? And I think about that even in my own home, I'm currently getting rid of furniture in our guest room because we've cleared out all the drawers. We don't have any need for that. We, you know, we've decluttered so much that why do we have this big empty dresser in the guest room, when the last time my parents came to visit, we noticed that they were uncomfortable because they didn't really have a good spot for their suitcase. And so you can start thinking through what what matters to other people. How can we be generous to the people who are coming to stay in this guest room? Well, they don't need a whole dresser, right? They need somewhere for their suitcase, you know? And so getting rid of stuff, it really, in interesting and subtle, some small, some big ways, allows us to consider other people um, more generously. So I'd love to talk about that a little bit more. So you mentioned in the book, uh, that the practicality of lightening the load physically was an idea that excited you. But this sense of like hurry to see more, do more, uh, on, especially on that biking trip is something that you actively had to recognize and um, feels maybe a little bit counterproductive to slow down when part of the purpose of lightening the load is to be able to do more. Um, I love this quote from your book. It says, it is only when we take less from life and create margin, like you just said, that we are able to help others. And it is only when we focus less on ourselves that we gain the ability to notice those around us and how we might impact their lives in positive ways. So this is just a nuanced way of capturing that sometimes minimalism is actually slowing down and minimizing our progress for kind of like the greater good. It reminds me, have you read um, any work by John Mark Comer? He has The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is his book. Yes, I haven't read that one, but I'm currently working uh, my way through, someone gave it to me, actually a friend, um, Practicing the Way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I love yeah. his work. And so I love that you know who he is. So one of my favorite quotes of all time is in his book, The Ruthless Elimination Hurry. And it just says, love and hurry are incompatible. Isn't that, I mean, like, I think I am never nice to my kids when I'm trying to rush them out the door, right? Like love and hurry are incompatible. So my question is a big one. All of that to say is that how did you learn to balance this sense of efficiency with a minimalist mindset surrounding hurry and productivity? Um, and the second part here is how can you expound on what this looks like when we interact with others in the world? Boy, that's a lot to unpack. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I was writing I, it out and I was like, this man is going to think I'm crazy, but you just have so much wisdom. So yes. How did you, that efficiency and that minimalism come together? And, and it's hard because I am an engineer and I am very task oriented, um, you know, and I want to like, this usually cracks people up or amuses my wife anyway. You know, I want to be more intentional about reaching out and keeping in touch with people. Um, Francie does this instinctively and amazingly. She spends a huge amount of time. She's not on social media, but she has, you know, probably 20 active texts going. Um, you know, she always phone calls old friends, like friends that she knew from high school and things like that. And so I want to be more intentional in that area, but I'm an introvert and I don't like talking on the phone. So I have a task that pops up every week to call someone from my contacts. 
Um, because if it's a task that I have to check off, I will do it. Um, and I, you know, I don't look forward to doing it, but I always enjoy the connections when I make them. I just need to push myself. That's my little hack to, you know, make that happen, to be intentional. Uh, you know, I think when you're backpacking, uh, when you have less gear, you're able to, instead of focusing on yourself, if, if you have a huge, heavy pack, all you can think about is how much I hurt and my knees hurt and my shoulders hurt. And that's all you think about. If you have a lighter pack, you have time to open your awareness to what's going on around you, you know, the birds, the plants, enjoying being grateful for the situation. And also your, it kind of opens the apertures, your awareness of others. And so you can see, Oh, Hey, you know, Johnny's been kind of quiet. Maybe I should go check in with him, how he's doing. Um, and so it, it provides that, that margin of energy and focus and takes it off yourself and allows you to focus on others. I don't know if I'm the only one that's driven by someone stopped by the side of the road, you know, with their hood up or something and, and thought, ah, I should probably stop and see if there's something I can do. I mean, I'm not going to fix their car cause I'm a auto mechanic idiot, but you know, I can, I have a cell phone. Um, but then looked at my watch and go, ah, I'm late. I got to go meet so-and-so or I'm supposed to be to work or whatever, because I've cut it close. And I, so I don't have time to do something that, you know, could have been put across my path for me to do. Um, so right. that gets back to kind of creating that margin and, and taking the focus off ourselves and, and trying to meet the no needs of those around us. Exactly. We can still be efficient in the way we move through the world. I'm the same way. My dad was in the Navy, so I am driven by the clock. I mean, I, I, like if I say I'm going to be somewhere and, and I tell myself in my head, I'm going to get there at 614, I, I will be driving to ensure that I arrive at 614. <laughs> and there's no, it's arbitrary, right? Um, so it's something I've really had to work on is like, and I, and I love efficiency, which is probably why I um, am so organized, right? Like that's what I share about on paring down is decluttering and organizing your life, right? Like I love efficiency, but like you said, it's that margin that really allows us to have to keep that. There's nothing wrong with being efficient, smart to be efficient in many ways, you know, but without the hurry, without the um, disregard for the needs that might pop up around you, that might slow you down. You know, I think that's, um, really important. And on the same note, something that you then kind of took a step further was that generosity isn't just about uh, what you can give, who you can help. Uh, can you share a little bit more about the flip side of that coin about being the receiver and why that's of equal importance? Sure. This was, I think, driven home to me probably on that bicycle trip in 1976. Uh, we would stop typically if we were in a, we slept a lot in rest areas. Um, but when we were kind of in a rural small town, we'd stop and knock on someone's door and say, Hey, can we camp on your front lawn? And this one time we um, knocked on a door and an old man answered. And I say old, I was 17. So <laughs> Who knows how old he really was, but he was like 45. <laughs> nah, yeah. But he moved old, you know, okay. I mean, that's kind of how I think of people's age is how they move, not really the calendar. And he was interested in our trip and he, he uh, said we'd be more comfortable around the side of the house. And he, he came out as we were setting up and, and asked, you know, what time we leave in the morning. And I said, hey, you know, cause I was driven to get the miles in and be efficient I said, oh, usually about seven o'clock and, and he looked disappointed. And upon question, he explained that his wife had really bad arthritis and it was particularly brutal in the morning. And so you know, they wanted to get up and make us big breakfast, but that was just too early and they couldn't do it. And, uh, you know, that was very touching. And I said, yeah, we didn't expect anything. You know, it's just great having a nice place to spend the night. So the next morning we're, we're getting up and uh, the door opens and he beckons us over and his wife had gotten up and there was more food than I've ever seen for breakfast in my life. I mean, just eggs and bacon and biscuits and potatoes and fruit and 
pancakes. I mean, we ate an, a stagger. I'm sure there are weeks worth of breakfast and groceries went into our bellies that morning. Um, but that always just impressed me knowing how much pain she had gone through to, to make that happen. Um, and actually it's, it's only been the last couple of years. I guess I can thank the podcast that I don't tear up talking about that. Um, and so I always remember that as, as, you know, being able to receive that was a gift to them. And I'm sure until they passed, they periodically told the story from their side, like, Hey, remember that summer of 76, those four kids, we've never seen someone eat so much, you know, but we sent them off full, you know, I wonder whatever happened. Cause this was pre-internet. So I wonder what happened to those boys and where they ended up. And so, yeah, it's important you know, it's, it's kind of like a river. You can't hold on to it. You have to receive it and give it to let it continue. Right. It doesn't work if it's just kind of one way, you know, I, I learned that lesson at a pretty young age when I was 16. And when I was 18, um, both of those summers, I worked in Chennai, India in AIDS homes and leper colonies. And it was obviously a life changing experience, except especially so young at such a young age. And I remember I was going into someone's home, uh, who was part of the church that we attended when we went and she was welcoming a small group of us. And this is a it was like basically kind of a cement room that was her home with a curtain on the front door. And, um, it was, that, that was all there was to it. And they had three kids and they would take turns who got the pillow at night. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was wild to me and I'm 16 and I'm trying to be, uh, you know, not treat them with pity. You know, I at least had the wherewithal, which I look back and I'm shocked that I had that wherewithal <laughs> at that age. But I remember being like, don't treat them like they don't have anything. You know what I mean? Just they're people. And uh, when we were leaving, the the woman gave me her hair tie and I still have it to this day. And it doesn't look like a typical hair tie in the United States. Um, it's just a rubber band. It has like kind of like fake hair looking curly hair around it. And she gave it to me and said, uh, I want you to have this or the interpreter helped her say that. And I remember saying, no, I'm not taking your hair tie. <laughs> like, you don't have a pillow. Like you probably need this hair tie. I didn't say that, but in my head, I'm like, I'm not taking your hair tie. Also it's a hair tie. You know, I don't, it's not a typical gift. So in my head, I, I didn't need to take it. And, um, and I said, Oh no, it's okay. You keep it. Thank you. No, 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 it's okay. And, and she just insisted Now you take this hair tie and that hair tie is represented. It re represented to me what the breakfast represents to you, which it was such a gift for her to be able to offer me this white woman of privilege from America, something of hers. I think that that gave her a sense of pride and a sense of generosity for her own spirit. She, like you said, no matter how little we have, being generous feels good for the giver. And so I think about that all the time now. And so when I read that in your book, I was like, yes, this is it. This is what I felt with the hair tie. <laughs> uh, see, and that story makes me tear up. I mean, that's just people that have so little but want to give something to you, you know, to, to make that bond and to give of what they have. That's amazing. It reminds me of a, I was watching a, sh a show once. Um, uh, I think take this job or something. It was, uh, Spurlock. He did uh, this thing where he would do some job for 30 days or something to expose it. Anyway, they, as part of that, they talked to some guy who, whose job had been outsourced to India and he was, you know, naturally upset and how dare they. And, you know, I'm supporting my family and everything. And then they took him over to India to meet the family who was now doing his job and same kind of thing. You know, they got like three generations living in a concrete house and they're like, they think, I mean, they consider they're well off because they've got a concrete house. I mean, they, mm. they got friends that are living in thatch houses and you know they welcomed him and and took him to the call center where they work and and uh you know had meals with them and i i always remember his discussion when he got back he says you know he says i'll find another job he says they are supporting so many people with that job uh and it's such a huge game changer for their life it's like i'll get another job uh, you know, just 
completely changes perspective. Right. It's that, it's that level of perspective. It's that level of humanizing everything and everyone. I think it's so easy to think, oh, you know, people over in India living in the slums. Like you just say that in a sentence and you're like, no, people, human beings with their children and the same emotions you feel and the same love that you feel and the same needs that you have to be generous and to receive and to give and all of those things fully, you know, uh, realized humans. And I know that sounds obvious and it's almost embarrassing to say that um, because it's such an obvious statement. But I think especially here in the Western culture and specific, specifically the United States, um, we we can look more so at, at a kind of a group as a whole, we don't see the individual. And we see it with pity, instead of recognizing that they have just as much to give as we do, maybe not physically, like physical items, but this their spirits and their knowledge and their wisdom is there, you know, and what a different like, what a different take on things, right? Like I think about birthday parties, it comes to mind, I have three little kids, they're three, four and six. So it's a time right now. <laughs> it's a time. <laughs> <laughs> they're currently at the park with my husband, I was like, get them out of the house, please. So so, uh, anywho, you know, I think about how, uh, you know, we, we've hosted some birthday parties at our house. I like to kind of keep them small backyard birthday parties. I think it builds community rather than meeting up at some big fancy event space. And we've done that too, but we've just found that backyard parties are just so fun. And so anyways, uh, you know, we don't do goodie bags. That's not part of our family values is to give goodie bags out because I know when my kids go to parties and go get goodie bags, I want to pull my hair out. I'm like, this is just a bunch of little dollar store stuff that's going to end up on our floors and the dog's going to eat it, you know, and I don't want it. And so I don't do that. Um, and we've had a couple of kids and, and not, no one has been rude by any means. And the parents have all been wonderful, but say like, where's our goodie, ba goodie bag, you know? And I think that we have created some traditions in the United States that we expect things when we show up at someone else's home almost, or that when we show up at a party or there's all this kind of this, what about what I get, you know, instead of like, what can I give? And I just feel like, I don't know, it's probably an obvious point, but we have to, we have to think about other people. And a way that you've done that, that I think is really unique and really special is that you've decided to keep less income and resources throughout your career for you and your family as a form of being able to serve others with your income like a savings account specifically to be able to meet the needs should they come up of people that you meet. Can you share a little bit about how that decision came about and the result of that? Sure. But first I was, I'm intrigued, but I'm going to take a, a short detour about the goodie bags, you know, and that besides the focus on ourselves, it also is like the focus we have on stuff. It's like, if I don't get a goodie bag, if there's not stuff, then it didn't happen. It's like, well, you had experiences, you had fun, you played, you sang, you know, but it's like, uh, but there's no stuff. So somehow it's, uh, it's not a value. And then what you were talking about, uh, how, how we see people in different circumstances, have you heard of, um, Christy McClellan? I don't know if she, I have. She has a great series. Uh, my, Francie's done some uh, Bible studies from her work and I've listened to some of her videos and they're amazing. But one story stuck with me um, that I think pertains to what we were talking about. And I, her, her series, one, she has got a couple series. One is Jesus and women, but she was leading some kind of tour in the middle East. And they had um, one of the women with her had some kind of tooth that was aching. It was just getting worse. And so Christy says, oh my gosh, I, I'm in a different country. I, I need to see a dentist or something. And um, so her guide who was a local said, oh yeah, yeah, no, you know, I know a guy, my cousin or whatever. And, you know, she says they, he takes us down the street and then we go down this back alley and there's like, you know, there's chairs, there's laundry hanging and we go in this little door and there's like linoleum and a chair. And, um, she's she the so the the dentist comes in and examines her and i forget i forget the timing i'm not telling the story exactly right but you know she she's worried about the guide uh she's talking to the guy going is this going to work out i mean i you know i'm responsible for this person and not knowing then the dentist speaks in flawless english yeah i was educated at oxford um this is fine. He says, the problem is like 
in in Western culture, you focus on how things look rather than you know the training and and the people. So you know we go into an office that looks nice. Well, the guy might be a quack or you know way out over his board in terms of his skills or what he charges. But here, you know, they, we have personal recommendation. This guy's trained. He doesn't have all the fancy stuff, but we focus on appearances so much here and make judgments based on that. So I don't know. That was just, that popped into my mind. Yes. I mean, it, this stuff it. isn't a true representation of anything. I mean, we have, we know this just from how many people are in debt in America, right? They can be driving a nice car. It means nothing. And that's such a great story too, that even when it comes to qualifications, like, yes, who cares how new the paint is on your wall? I just want somebody who actually knows what they're doing to my tooth. Yeah, exactly. So, and they had a great result, you know, but it was like, it would, it, it would surprise us basically walking into the, the waiting room. Um, so as, yeah, as far as being uh, generous and specifically, this is with our finances, um, I wanted a way to be, um, more intentional rather than, you know, I see a need and it's like, eh, I'm a little short this month, you know, my kids need braces or whatever to always have those resources for needs that God puts in my path. You know, here's someone that, Hey, this has your name on it. And so we started creating a separate uh, checking account and I actually did this before I was a believer. Um, and it doesn't matter what you call it. I initially called it a world peace account. I don't know what was going through my mind when I named it that. Um, um, the I competed in the Miss America organization. So it feels like a very pageant answer, world peace. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it sure does. Uh, yeah. So uh we called it the peace fund for many years and we started with a modest amount. It was just 5% of our after tax income. Um, but you know, it adds up and then you have a separate account that's, you know, not our money anymore. I mean, it's not in our budget. We're not going without anything if we spend that money cause it's already set aside. And so we can, we can meet needs. And over the years, it's grown. Uh, I mean, our income has grown and our needs luckily haven't grown as much, um, or our wants, I should say, haven't grown as much as, as our income. And so now a significant portion of our, uh, before tax income goes into this separate account. Um, and you know, my general rule of thumb is if, if I don't notice it, I could probably increase it. You know, I want it to be, I always think of the end of uh, Schindler's List movie where he's, he's Schindler's going down and looking at his cufflinks. I could have saved another lives with these cufflinks. I mean, he did so much, but he's thinking he could have done more. And so, you know, if, if I don't notice the difference in our lifestyle from setting money aside, well, then I probably should set some more aside. And don't get me wrong. I mean, we have a we have a great life. We could definitely do tons more, but that's kind of my personal, if it, if there isn't a little bit of a anxiety in the pit of the stomach, then I need to move, move the bar a little bit. Um, and so that's allowed us to do things. Obviously we, we donate to traditional sources. We support a local church, a number of ministries. Um, but a lot of it, a fair amount ends up going to non-traditional things. Um, uh, someone that Francie worked with, her son had made some bad decisions, ended up in prison and died in prison. And she didn't have the money for a funeral. So, you know, we're able to write a thousand dollar check and it doesn't matter to us because that money's already been set aside. Hmm. Um, I had another one, you know, at this stage in life, it's exciting when I meet someone new because I'm always curious to see, are they going to help me somehow? Or am I going to help them somehow? Or you know, is it both? And I had one uh, a year or two ago where I needed to get some good photography, um, you know, because doing a website and got to got to do the the proper things. And so I I asked a uh, asked a friend in town, and he recommended this one guy. I met him for coffee. And he says, "Well, I don't do that kind of photography, uh, you know." But here's this other guy, and shared that this guy had recently gotten a you know, terminal diagnosis. Um, and, 
so anyway, so I, I meet with the second photographer, local photographer. Uh, but in, before I met with him, I realized like, oh no, I know this through hiker who does photography. I'll just have her take the photos, you know, cause actually she took one at an event decades ago that I've been, you know, using, <laughs> using since. So, so I used her. So I thought, well, I'll still meet with this guy for coffee and see what's going on. So we got to talking and, you know, originally I thought he was going to help me get some good photography, but we were able to help him. He wanted to go to Patagonia before he died and do some hiking there. So, you know, that's something we can do because we have a separate fund. So it's fun when you meet people thinking they have something for you and you find out, oh no, I'm supposed to help them. That's and, cool. you know, you, you wear those lenses. I think that's really, um, what's so inspiring about you, Glenn, is like you, are aware of that you I think unless we go through the world with that mindset of generosity receiving and giving these opportunities will they'll fly under the radar we won't even realize that they're there um we won't develop relationships on a level where we're going to hear what a need might be we aren't sharing ourselves as vulnerably where people might be able to identify a need they can solve for us right like it's vulnerable even going back to that 1970s bike trip to knock on someone's door and say, can I sleep in your yard for the night? <laughs> I'm biking across the country, right? There's a shared level of vulnerability there that these relationships then can uh, in turn become generous, you know, mutually so. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, it's, it's just a beautiful way to move through the world and to approach relationships. And I want to read another quote from the book here. It says, some people seem to think that charitable giving should be handled by the ultra rich, and they always demand to know what the rich are doing with their millions. I prefer to look at the one person I can control, me, and ask if I'm doing enough. Am I comfortable with what I am doing to make a difference without worrying whether other people are doing what they should? Uh, and I, so I appreciate that you shared that your giving didn't start when you had all the money in the bank, you know, and people will learn more about your personal story and um, your kids and all of that in your book. And you had your own expenses and your own things to think about. So it wasn't just because you are this wildly, you know, successful backpacking engineer who is friends with Matthew McConaughey, right? Like all these things that like people be like, well, of course he's giving, right? You know, that's not how it works, you know? And and in our own lives, and, you know, my husband and I talk about this often is, um, you know, we, I mean, full disclosure, made what we feel was not a wise financial decision when we moved to Florida. We move every three years in the Coast Guard. And um, for the sake of safety and um, not being able to see the house before we bought it, we ended up just buying in a neighborhood that we knew was safe and we knew was good, um, but it was going to push us a little bit financially to live here. And it has really come into play in so many more ways than anticipated and taught us a hard lesson the hard way that if we still want to be able to spend generously for other people, it is much harder. And it is, it's, and that has taken a toll on us in ways we didn't even realize, you know, and even when it comes to, let's say something like, uh, for us, you know, tithing is important. And, you know, some people have said, well, then don't just cut back there you know, and then you have some, I'm like, but I think it should hurt. It should, this should be a hard lesson for us. You know, what is our priority here? Like, are we going to continue to give in this world or are we going to send our kids to more summer camps? You know, like, which are we going to do? And you have to make those hard choices. And so anyways, it's nice to be able to learn from someone like you who has made those decisions and set such a beautiful example. Uh, I cannot believe it's already a 40 minutes in and I have a thousand questions. <laughs> so most of the, what I read so far in the book focuses on this generosity piece, but obviously based even in your um, subtitle, it's generosity, gratitude, and curiosity. So can you kind of do a high level explanation of how taking less and doing more relates to gratitude and also to curiosity? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of gratitude, there's one thing about backpacking with a very small load is you realize how little you need to be content and happy. Um, you know, with five pounds of gear, I'm safe. I have everything I need, nothing I don't need, and I can enjoy myself for weeks at a time. And so that's a good reset. I think we get used to in the United States, pretty darn comfortable existence. And, you know, we just take for granted 
in in normal life, if the water is not hot out of the faucet and I have to wait for it, well, that's inconvenient. And this is taking now another minute that I didn't have anticipate. You know, after a couple of weeks of sleeping on the dirt and drinking water out of streams, having potable water on demand at multiple locations in my house at any temperature I want at any time I want is amazing. It's a miracle. Um, so it just, it's, it's great. I think having less resets your gratitude, uh, kind of like, like going to India, you know, seeing how other people live. Travel is another great way to, to reset your gratitude, um, to realize how much we have. And, you know, I start every day with gratitude and thinking about the things that I appreciate today and things that happened yesterday. And they can be very, very small things, but it helps. I think backpacking with very little helps kind of reset that, that gratitude and curiosity. We, we kind of talked about, well, actually in terms of gratitude before we leave that, um, there's an interesting way of looking at that is happiness being a, a two by two matrix uh, things that we have and don't have. And then on the other axis, things that we um, want and don't want. And, and I think most people spend a lot of time, you know, maybe we're grateful for the things we have that we want. Um, probably spend way too much time thinking about the things we want that we don't have that maybe other people have. But one huge source of gratitude that's overlooked is thinking about things that we don't have that we don't want you know, things like, and part of that is paying attention to other people and seeing what they're going through. It's like, Ooh, they, yeah, they just got a terminal diagnosis. Hmm. I don't have that. That gives me new appreciation and gratitude for my health. Um, so yeah, that's another, another piece of gratitude and curiosity. You know, I, when I'm backpacking, I'm always tinkering with my gear. I, I'm always taking notes as what's, what's working, what's not working, what's working well, um, what I think could work better. And as we were talking about creating margin, it, it allows you to kind of open your focus and be curious about things. Um, you know, say, gosh, I wonder what's going on with that person. They seem a little quiet today. Or, you know, I never noticed, I'm trying to think, you know, I never noticed why they drive an old car when they could afford a new one. I wonder what that's about, you know, and, and just being curious and, and opening those conversations. I liked what you said about being vulnerable so that people can figure out a way to, to be generous to you. I, I hadn't thought about that, but if you don't share what's going on, people don't know how they could help. And they could have, they could have a word for you. They could have, you know, it could be as simple as like, you need a couch and they have an extra couch or something, or your backpack's too heavy and oh gosh, they know how to lighten backpacks, whatever it may be. But if you don't share that, if you don't get below the surface on that relationship and go a little deeper, they don't have that opportunity to give. So that's, that's a big takeaway I'm, I'm getting today. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to be able to offer something in return, you know, and, and I love what you said about the gratitude to me, it represents this contentment piece that I speak about a lot when it comes to living with less. And then the curiosity piece speaks to that intentionality, right? Like, are we intentionally making changes and moving and tweaking our lives to reflect our core values, you know, and, and I appreciate you bringing up that piece too, about the vulnerability, because I was the speaker at our church's women's event last year. And I was speaking about community. And I think they asked me because of um, the fact that I move every three years, I have to like create a new community from scratch. Yeah, and that right. really is something that I've learned is that, yes, of course, I am, uh, you know, the kind of like, I, I joke, I'm like the creepy one that will ask for someone's address when I hear they're going through something. And I will just like, leave a, you know, baked casserole on their door. Like you have three kids, you probably don't want to make dinner tonight. I hear your husband's out to see like, I'm just going to leave it there. You don't even have to talk to me. You know, <laughs> like there is that aspect of giving, but I really have learned that not in a complainy way, of course, but I'm just sharing about my life um, and not tr trying to pretend that I'm perfect. And, you know, we live in the panhandle of Florida right now where it's the South, basically. <laughs> and so 
I would say more than anywhere I've lived, which is a lot of places. I've lived in, I've moved a lot, not just for the military, but before I met my husband, you know, I was in Virginia and then I moved up to New York City and then I was outside of DC and I love moving. So I'm a good military wife. But more than anywhere, I've noticed here appearances really matter. You know, it's that women in the South, right? They're always dressed and they got their makeup on and the whole thing. This is not me. I stand out like a sore thumb around here. (laughs) So, you know, but I I wanted to encourage the women at our church to really break down those pretenses, right? Like that your home doesn't have to be in perfect shape every time someone comes over, because then what are they going to feel? If your house is perfectly immaculate when they come over, and you apologize because there's like a stuffed animal on the floor, then how are they going to feel when you come over? Oh, she expects my home to be as immaculate as hers. And it creates this cycle of um, just not being truly authentic and vulnerable with our humanity, you know? And, and once we kind of break through that barrier, there's nothing better than a friend. When you walk into their house, it's kind of a mess. You go get yourself your own, you know, a cup out of the fridge and you know what, or out of the cupboard, right? That is community right there. And it's because of the vulnerability of not being perfect. So um, I, I appreciate that you uh, you kind of latched onto that a bit. Um, okay, my very last question here is more specifically about the book. I want to know why you ended up writing a book, and this is why because to me it is another example of taking less for you, like offering up your learned wisdom so freely, like you did with those first patterns of the ultralight backpacks that you used. I love that you just were like sure here's the pattern, you know, before you realized it was going to become a whole company and. A hundred percent of the profits of this book are going to the Pacific Crest Trail Association. So, you know, obviously you're not in it for the money. So what was your hope in writing this book? The the way I came to write a book was, and it's, it's a long story, it's in the book. I ended up being uh, friends with and business partners with John Mackey, the co-founder of Whole Foods Market. And John is a huge hiker and likes to invite his friends on hikes. He's kind of the inspiration for my, uh, what I call the list. And we'd be hiking along and he would say, Glenn, you should write a book. We're, he's a big gear guy. So there's lots of talk about gear and how to optimize things. He says, Glenn, you should write a book. And I always said, well, I think there's plenty of great books on there on ultralight backpacking. And I don't really see the need to add my two cents to it. But he'd keep up at year after year. Glenn, you should write a book. I'll write the foreword. And then he got his friends starting to pester. I'd be hiking along with one of them and they'd be going, hey, I hear you're working on a book. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so I finally figured I better get to it because having the offer of having John Mackey, hugely successful guy in so many areas of life, write the foreword was probably too good to pass up. And I probably had to not waste that opportunity. So so I wrote a book and, you know, my people sometimes ask, well, what do you, what's the one thing you hope people get from the book? And it's, you know, it depends on what that, everyone needs something different. And I know we hear things when we need to hear them, kind of the teacher appears when the student is ready. Um, and we hear things in different words. You know, people could say things in a slightly different words and suddenly we hear it, even though people have been saying it to us for years. Uh, So it's just, it's my hope that, you know, the words I've chosen, the stories I've told uh, will for some people meet them where they are and give them some tools to greater contentment in life. And I can't thank you enough for what you share in the book. You know, I think narrative often sticks with us. So well, right? It's that narrative piece, the stories that are told that tend to be the lessons we remember the most. Uh, And there are so many of those that you do share so generously in this book. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I will say too, like, I love that answer because I'm an author as well. And my book is about the nine different facets of life that can make anyone feel like they're behind. And so through uh, kind of pulling together different studies, as well as anecdotes from my own life, right, I share there's really no such thing as a timeline in life, whether you feel behind in your relationship because you're not married, or you don't have kids yet, or your career isn't where you think it's supposed to be, or you don't own a house yet, like all of these different areas. And it's really exciting as an author to hear just the variety of feedback And I I am excited for you to hear that too. Like there are some people, like you said, they're going to really grasp onto that generosity piece. There's going to be some people that are like, oh, I need to be more intentional and curious or this story stuck with me. And it's a real treat as an author to hear that feedback and just hear how differently it hits so many different people. It's the same book, but it hits people in completely different ways. So 
that's exciting. These are two quick ones. I ask everyone at the end of my podcast. I promise we are actually wrapping up here. Um, what is one thing you're currently paring down? One thing I'm currently paring down, I am using less plastic bags. That's a great one. Okay. And what are you looking forward to right now? I'm looking forward to our next trip. Uh, we're headed to Iceland here in uh, a few weeks. So just got back from the Netherlands. So we like to travel. We like being home too. So there's no. There's both of no, those things are great. Yeah. Both of those things are great. I feel the same way. I'm a huge adventurer. We have a camper van. We love taking it out on these ridiculous trips with our kids to parks and wherever we're going. And then I also equally am very, very happy at home. And, you know, we didn't even touch on, I, at the very beginning, I kind of teased oh, these trips you take with people you don't know very well, you know, and um, I, you know, want to hear more about all of your adventures of where you've been and favorite places and all of that. But I know so much of that um, is answered in the book. So I will leave those as teasers for those of you who I know are going to grab, take less, do more. Um, and on that note, where can everyone buy your book or follow along with you to learn more about your mission? Uh, probably the best place is my website, glennvanpesky.com. You can, the book's available at your local bookstore. They can order it for you or anywhere online. Um, also, I have an offer um, which results in more money going to the Pacific Crest Trail Association. If people want a signed book, uh, they can email me, glenn at glennvanpesky.com. And I will, uh, they can Venmo me the $25 and I will send a signed book in a custom mailer with a couple of mini lip balms to the address that they give me. So that's another option. Uh, which I have to say, my kids are obsessed with those mini lip balms. You were so generous to send us one of those packages. And they just think it's the funniest thing. They're like, look how small these little mini lip balms are. Like, I was like, yeah, take less. This makes sense. It's half the amount of lip balm. So anyways, it's a really fun package. I encourage you guys to take advantage of that. And thank you, Glenn, so, so much for coming on today. It really, really has been a treat. Pleasure has been mine. It's been, been my treat, definitely. You just listened to an episode of Paring Down with me, Shannon Laco. If you enjoyed the show, it would mean the world if you can leave a review wherever you listen and share this episode with a friend. Those reviews really are what keeps a podcast on its feet for the long haul. And I will read every single one with a huge smile on my face. So thank you ahead of time. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe. Also, be sure to follow along on Instagram at Paring Down Podcast, where I offer lots of tips and inspiration for parents down along with what's new here on the podcast. Till next time.